Welcome back to another podcast. I am joined with Lily Ray. Hey, how's it going? Uh, very good. And today we're going to be speaking about like a variety of different things. So I know that you dabble into Google Discovery, EAT. You've obviously got your SEO agency as well. Um, so yeah, I think where I want to start with, and I think it's quite a hot topic as well, is the Google discovery side of stuff. Sure. Um, so one common question that a lot of people are asking at the minute is, is it easy for a new website to get into Google discover? Like what's, what's that process like? I don't know about easy. I mean, especially lately because there's just so much competition and also so many big changes that Google is making to Google discover. But, uh, in some cases, it's easier to see traffic there more quickly than you might see with organic search. Organic search in general takes more time. You have to really prove to Google and search engines that you're a trustworthy website, which of course there's exceptions, but generally that takes several months. Uh, Google Discover, if Google has signals that indicate that people are really interested in your content, like for example, if something's really viral on social media, or maybe it's being shared all throughout like Slack and WhatsApp or whatever ecosystem they're using to kind of pick up on like, oh, people are really enjoying this content. It can surface in Google Discover for a relatively unknown website. And that's something we've actually seen a lot of with like spammers, for example. Spammers are starting up new websites or buying expired domains and getting a lot of performance in Google Discover. So yeah, I think it's easier than SEO. Oh, that's quite interesting. So what, what you're basically saying is if you have diverse traffic, not just focusing on Google search, so for example, you might have Pinterest traffic or Twitter traffic, you might have a higher chance of popping up into Google discovery. Am I right? I think so. So Google won't confirm this like right. outright, um, but I, it's, it's what we see. I don't necessarily, I can't necessarily tie it back to like Pinterest or like, again, like things like WhatsApp and Slack and all that is, shows, shows up as direct traffic in Google analytics anyway. So it's hard to pinpoint the exact source, but anecdotally, like, I'll publish a piece of content on, let's say, the AMPSIV website where I work and share it on Twitter. It starts to pick up traction on Twitter. And then two hours later, it's in Google Discover. And like, we're not a website that Google's regularly checking for Discover content. So there's very much some type of like strong signal coming from social media for discovery purposes. Right. Okay. That that's that yeah, that's super interesting. Cause I know that after the HCU. Um, and the November core algorithm update, people have been diversifying their, their traffic sources. So there are people that are focusing on Facebook group traffic, um, Facebook paid ads, PPC, and also uh, Pinterest as well. Is, is that is that something common that you've seen throughout like so, some some of the people that you work with? I mean, I think there's a kind of specific type of website where that makes a lot of sense. And I'm I'm actually quite happy to see that a lot of these people who are very focused on like affiliate, you know, traffic and, and revenue are diversifying their traffic sources because as as we've seen in the past, let's say six months, you know, relying too much on Google organic or any singular traffic source is not a great idea long term. So, you know, by driving traffic from Pinterest and Facebook and other places, what you're effectively doing is building a brand, right? Mm -hmm. And Google does draw upon these sources, whether or not they confirm this, there's definitely some type of indirect relationship between how well a company does on social media, whether that's even just because users trust the company more. So it's like an in, a indirect kind of thing or imperceptible kind of thing. But, you know, generally speaking, the companies and the sites that do better in organic search have a more robust social media following anyway. Right. Okay. It's, um, it's interesting you say that because a lot of the, um, the niche websites only just rely on, on SEO traffic. And I feel like as, as just a business owner, you would never just want to rely on, for example, if, if you're like a, a plumber, you would never want to just rely on word of mouth, um, referrals, right. You would want to like yeah. potentially do Facebook ad traffic and, and SEO and what, whatever else, even, even for example, um, yellow pages ads and stuff, people still do them in, in the UK, believe it or not. But <laughs> I feel like now, now that we've seen what, what we have seen in the past six months, it does kind of make sense when, when you're looking at some of these websites, it's like, well, you can, you can tell that you were just manipulating the, the, 
the algorithm to try to, to just push your um your products and stuff like that yeah one one question i want to ask you and i think this will be really interesting is let's say for example you're in the market of buying a new television right and this is pre um hcu right so let's say mid 2023 would you search best televisions 2023 and go off of whoever's there me personally no <laughs> <laughs> sorry to say uh my my answer to this question has changed over time especially recently yeah. and it's not necessarily the fault of google in fact google has a really difficult job which is that everyone and their mother wants to rank for that keyword because everybody understands the value of affiliate links and affiliate revenue so by definition it creates this really complicated uh, user experience because how can the user possibly trust that what they're reading is objective? And mm -hmm. I mean, I don't fully understand the inner workings of the affiliate world. That's not really my world, but I've watched plenty of videos and read plenty of articles. And I know for a fact, you can't trust what you read, generally yeah. speaking. So p people like the wire cutter, like websites like the wire cutter or New York times and other places where they really, really try to go above and beyond to indicate why you can trust their content, I might read something like that and take that a lot more seriously, but it's very tricky nowadays to use Google as an SEO that understands what's actually happening in the background. Yeah. So let, let's, let's say if, if you were in the market for a new television, how would you go about doing it? Cause obviously I, I'm, I've got the exact same answer as you, by the way, I wouldn't tr trust the SERPs. Yeah. I think I would probably just have to like use various sources and right. understand the real thing about this and this is something that i'm actually quite passionate about is like understanding what you're reading or what you're watching and who that content creator is or who that website is and whether or not you can trust their content which is ultimately what google's trying to do with its organic search algorithms it's like literally what eeat is all about mm -hmm. but like if the wire cutter or i don't know trustedreviews.com or one of these review sites if I've had a good experience reading their content before and I have a history of like, you know what, they said that this was the best TV or this was the best whatever DJ setup or whatever. And I, I like the site. I believe in the site. I trust the site. I think they do a good job. I'm going to go back to that site over time. So, yeah. or I'm going to see that site in the search results and go there and kind of trust their content and then maybe corroborate that with watching some YouTube videos. At this point, I'd probably honestly use perplexity AI because I'm using perplexity for everything now. Right. It's like, just to, it's kind of exactly what you need from a search engine is perplexity AI. But yeah, honestly, a variety of different sources, but really just with that understanding of where the content's coming from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think the what, one of the biggest people that like stands out to me, and I don't, I don't know if he still does YouTube now, is um, Linus Tech Tips. He okay. like I don't, I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He had like a couple million subscribers, and all of his videos was like. PC related, keyboards reviews, mouse reviews, and it, it never really was pushing the product down down your throat. It, if, if the keyboard was good, it would say it's good. If it was bad, it would say it's bad. And I feel like a lot of the, the affiliate websites, every single product is amazing. <laughs> and they're just trying to push it down down your throat. Yeah, you raise a really good point, which I think is actually like something that I try to convey in all of my SEO advice and all of my marketing advice for a really long time, which is that people gravitate towards people and they gravitate towards authentic people. So it doesn't matter if uh, the person you just described, if he's on YouTube or, or his own website or Facebook or whatever, it's about the person. Mm -hmm. Because if people have read or consumed his content and said, you know what? This feels like no BS. This feels like he's being honest. It doesn't feel like he has some goal to like push the most expensive product first every time. People are going to seek out that content and it, it might not even happen on Google. Maybe they follow him on TikTok. Maybe they follow him somewhere else, right? But yeah. that's what I try to do with my marketing. It's like, I mean, you could probably tell I'm just me. Like I'm just authentically me in everything that I do. And people, not everybody, but people tend to like it. And yeah. So I think that's what I would recommend that people do. Try to be on all the different platforms, but just be, be yourself, be authentic. Yeah, I think, I think what, what a lot of people, and we'll, we'll gravitate towards this, is a lot of people online say that EAT is built like BS, right? They don't believe in it, right? And I, I don't think that people understand that this podcast that we're doing right now 
is EEAT because obviously yeah. I'm, I'm having a conversation with you. People are understanding who Lily Ray is. People are understanding who I am. And I think that everyone just seems to think that they need to be doing 600 podcasts, 50 videos, and it's it's not always the case. Am I, am I, can we, are, are we on one term there? Like, can we agree on that? Yeah, The anybody that's spending any time debating about whether or not EEAT is important or, or using anecdotes about, oh, this spammy AI website gets to rank number one, therefore EEAT doesn't matter. To be quite honest, you're all wasting your time. You're all wasting your time. Like, this is indisputable. The fact that you should have experience, expertise, authority, and trust on the thing that you're trying to sell or the information that you're trying to provide, it's not controversial. It's just facts. So like, you can continue to have those debates and waste your time doing that. I personally don't have time for it. I did that four years ago. I don't have time anymore. But like, yeah, <laughs> everyone should be able to say, I follow this website, this person, because I really like their content. I've seen them on podcasts. I've seen them on YouTube videos. I've read their articles. And guess what? Google makes connections. It draws connections from all the different places. So to your point, this podcast, Google's capable of understanding podcasts. It has its own feature for highlighting podcasts. It can understand audio. It can understand video. It can understand timestamps. And I've seen time and time again, because selfishly, I use my own name as an SEO keyword that I'm paying attention to. Mm -hmm. Google always makes connections about, oh, even Bing chat, you can say, hey, what did Lily say about EEAT on that podcast? And Bing chat will know right there what I said, right? So yeah. it's like, Yes, this thing matters, whether or not it's a direct ranking signal. It's just a, a silly philosophical debate. Yeah, definitely. I think one one thing that was um, really interesting to see, and, and you, you've probably seen this yourself, is as soon as I started doing more like the personal branding stuff, just on the YouTube side of stuff, I had my Google mm -hmm. search console for casuradash.com set up. As soon as I started uploading like daily videos to my YouTube, the, the search impressions for my name went up on, on Google. Oh. And obviously, pe people speak about branded search and stuff like that. And I'm, I'm not actively trying to search, um, rank casradash.com. It's kind of just there. Yeah. Um, but it was really interesting to see that um, side of stuff, yeah. like the branded search and stuff. It's all connected for sure. Um, would, you, would you say that EAT is like a one size fits all then? Because, like, don't get me wrong, I 100% I believe in EEAT. But for example, if, if say for example, you're a local plumber, you're gonna need less EEAT as opposed to like a WebMD competitor, right? Well, it's it's not it's not one size fits all to your point. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't mean that a plumber doesn't also need it. It just means that a plumber needs it in a, pl a way that Different way. Uh, a user would expect to see it for a plumber. Um, actually, some of the examples that I've given in talks for the past few years about experience and expertise and everything are companies like small businesses, like plumbers or electricians or whatever, because the best ones that have the best success in the marketing world are somehow finding a way to leverage the experience and the insights from the people that work, the plumbers, the electricians or whatever, like working with those people to inform the content creation. Like I'm not asking a plumber to go write 10 blogs a day. That's not going to happen. But maybe you have a content creator who works on the works at the company or represents the company, and you get the plumber on the phone for 20 minutes and you ask them six questions about what are the best ways to like drain a pipe or whatever. Yeah, they're going to tell you some really unique stuff. You're going to write that down, and then you're going to say, "This is what our in-house expert says about the thing." And more often than not, you're going to get what's called information gain. You're gonna get something that hasn't been said elsewhere on the internet because you're actually sourcing information from experts and you're not trying to like reverse engineer what everybody already said in the SEO mm -hmm. space. So that's still a version of EEAT, but no, it's not saying that you're a top surgeon at Harvard Medical Clinic or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, th I think that's, that's where a lot of people misunderstand it. They're like, what, so I'm a local plumber. I need to go and get a, a Harvard degree. And it's like, no, you're, you're misunderstanding this. Because yeah. we, we, do, we do something similar with um, one of the construction companies that we work with. They, so for example, if, if they win a job, the, the, the guys that are actually working on the job, they've been trained to like take before and after photos and also like time lapses and stuff of them actually working on it. And again, it's, cool. it's like, it's just adding like videos and stuff like that to the actual YouTube channel. Again, it helps with the EAT side of stuff. Um, yeah. One thing that I wanted to ask you on, and I thought this was a really good video that I watched. Maybe I think I've watched it about a few times, a few times now. 
but the last time I watched it was maybe like two weeks ago. And it's the video that you've done on the Google Search Central YouTube channel. Less content equals higher rankings. Um, oh, with Martin Split? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, and the reason why I find it interesting is because a lot of people are talking about like topical authority and writing as many articles as you possibly can on one subject. What's what's your thoughts on both sides of the less content side of stuff and also the topical authority side of stuff? Yeah, I think um, the, both things are true. Like both, you, you know, I think it's in general better to have less content if you're able to get your point across and your authority across with less content, because especially now, Google has a dedicated ranking system called the Helpful Content System, specifically aimed at demoting sites that are doing too much SEO content. That's like a new factor in the whole equation that we didn't have before. So three years ago, yeah, you could say, let's write one article about every possible topic that we found and also ask.com or, you know, people also ask, like, like everyone has the same tools at their disposal. And theoretically, every but this is exactly what happened. Every website took every keyword with search volume, wrote a piece of content about every possible keyword and like, oh, great. Now I have authority. That's not exactly how it works. And I think that Google's getting smarter. And I think if you approach it differently, and again, I'm going to use myself as an example, not even because I ever really did this intentionally, but just because I, it happened authentically. And I think that it's rewarding both myself and AMSIV, our digital agency, from an SEO perspective. Mm -hmm. If you write about the things that you know or that you're passionate about, like for me, it's when a Google update happens, I write something. Or if I'm seeing a really big problem on Google that I literally observe because I'm seeing it in my research, I'll write about that. Nobody told me to write that. Nobody had it on a calendar that I, need, I needed to write that. Uh, I didn't find it in SEO keyword research tools. In fact, I don't use SEO keyword research tools when I write my content. It's not written for SEO. It's written mm. because it's valuable, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. um, so I think if you're a plumber, for example, it's not about going on Google Google uh, Ads, Keyword Planner, or whatever, SEMrush, whatever tool you use, and being like, these are the six things we need to talk about. It's like talking to your plumber and being like, what do you think are the most important things that people need to know when they're hiring a plumber? What are the things you encounter most frequently on the job? And use that to kind of inform what you write about. Then you can cross-reference it with how people actually search. But less is more. The more that you can consolidate that into fewer valuable pages, the better you're going to perform. Yeah, I think so. One one of the things that we've recently been seeing um, with like recovering websites and stuff is um, obviously exactly what you've mentioned. People have just expanded from let's say may maybe they needed fi five hundred pages, they've expanded to seven hundred and fifty or a thousand pages, right? Just for the sake of search volume. Yeah. Um, but one thing that we've started to see and it's helping massively is. Um, concatenating pages down so instead of having let's say five pages covering five different questions you might have one page talking about the five questions and again yep. that's still topical authority um but it's just focused on the one page um, yeah have, have you seen anything like that yourself a hundred percent i mean that's yeah. that's a huge part of the audits that we do and that i do with clients mm -hmm. because especially again the helpful content system has thrown a wrench into seo in general, like it, it might have been completely different five years ago. Five years ago, we might have told you, and it always depends on what is happening in the search landscape. So when you Google the keyword, if you see that what Google is choosing are individual pages to answer that question, then you recommend individual pages. Google's telling you what it wants. But what we're seeing more and more of is consolidation and Google's ability to pick answers from different parts of the page. That's that's been the trend for like three or four years. My good friend Cindy Crum, she would talk. She's been speaking about what she calls fra fraggles. It's a very good term to research if you're in the SEO space. Uh, it's a combination of fragment and handle. And what it means is there's a fragment on the page that answers the user's question, and there's a way for Google to jump directly to that section, whether it's through a jump link or an anchor, or whether Google just does it automatically by itself, which Google does with SGE, for example. It doesn't need the entire page content. It just needs the answer to the question. So now we're in a space where if it makes sense to consolidate those five relevant subtopics on one page, Google can pick and choose precisely the section that it needs. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. Um... One one question that I've got, 
and th th this will be a slightly controversial one. Do you think niche websites are dead? <laughs> uh, no, no, because listen, niche websites and websites that were hit by the helpful content update are not necessarily the same thing. Mm -hmm. Niche websites who follow certain SEO guidance and got themselves hit by the helpful content update, which I understand most people did not see that coming. I understand that. I don't mean to toot my own horn, but I would have seen it coming because I've been doing this for so long, right? Like I've mm -hmm. helped so many companies with core updates that, I, and I did, there are websites that are doing this. And I don't know, guys, you're pushing it a little bit too far with the SEO first, trying to have the year in every single title tag, trying to have all these different gimmicks and tricks that work for SEO, but are not a great user experience. When you push that too far, generally speaking, Google devalues that content. I didn't see the bloodbath of the helpful content update coming. <laughs> that was extreme, yeah. but I understand that a lot of people couldn't see it coming. So I, I want to be respectful of that. However, um, to have a niche website is not to necessarily do all those things. Mm -hmm. You can have a niche website like you could be a lawyer who blogs about things that you found in the legal space this year. And you're just doing that because you're a lawyer. That's your niche. That's a niche website, right? Yeah. So there's two different things, but I think the real question is like, if you're truly passionate about this niche and you didn't just buy the domain because it was a domain that was available for sale and it had great marketing potential and great DA or whatever it is that you care about, like you should probably be, publishing content on that niche blog all the time anyway, because you're passionate about it. But if you're doing it for SEO, it's going to be really tricky going forward. Yeah, definitely. So um, a, a couple things about the, the niche sites, because I, I remember HCU happened and there was a handful of people that was getting a lot of hate on Twitter. Um, I was one of them. <laughs> Yourself was one of them. Um, and a few things that we, I think we actually agreed on this a few months back, um, website layouts, like the, the themes that we were seeing, because everyone was sending us websites. I think you, you must've got hundreds, maybe thousands of websites sent to your, to, to your DMs. I got um, a couple, like maybe 20, 30 sites sent, sent to myself. And if I'm being honest, every single website that I looked at, I wouldn't trust it at all. <laughs> It's amazing how that happens, right? Like every site owner is somehow has the best site on the internet. And then the third parties are like, I don't know. It's not that great. Yeah. You know, I don't mean to be mean. I understand how much effort people put into these sites. That part's clear, you know? Mm -hmm. And I understand if you put all your eggs in one basket or you're a travel blogger who figured out that you can make a living off of this five or 10 years ago and you doubled down on it, that's a really horrible wake up call. Like, I don't mean to diminish that, but yeah, as soon as you bring in a third party, which you probably should have done a long time ago, subcapacity mm -hmm. uh all the things that you think are so great about your website turn out to not be that great <laughs> according to other people yeah sorry definitely it's yes. um like I, I don't know how many websites you saw but there was a lot of websites with fake offers with the this person doesn't exist image <laughs> i can see you yeah. shaking your head already <laughs> Such a waste of time. And it's like, this is what I mean about people that are like, oh, EEH doesn't matter because somebody used a mid journey bio image and it worked for six months. I'm like, that's not evidence that it doesn't work. Yeah. You're capitalizing on a loophole and you're probably going to get in trouble later. And then when you get in trouble, you're going to be like, I didn't see it coming because it worked. Things yeah. often work before they don't in SEO, almost always. That's how yeah. SEO works. Google needs data about how people are spamming Google to create new Google updates. Mm hmm yeah definitely. always how it's worked i, th I think um like we had a very similar-ish wake-up call um a few years back and we, we, we we've we've got aff affiliate websites that we want to try and flip and sell and stuff like that um and one of the potential buyers um basically said like if you guys are using pbns or anything like that um you could go from like a three million dollar valuation to like a $1.5 million valuation. And, and we're like, yeah, we, we may as well just do things correctly. Cause even though PVNs work now, it doesn't mean that, that they'll be working in six months time or in a year's time. Yeah, but Google gets better. I mean, there's various link spam updates throughout the year. There's spam brain. There's all these new technologies where it's like, <laughs> 
it's like evading paying taxes forever because it's working and thinking that, I mean, maybe in the US it's a different conversation, but thinking that they'll never catch you because they haven't caught you yet. Like that's not how it works. Like eventually you'll probably get caught. Maybe they're gonna start using AI at the IRS to figure out who's ev evading taxes. And now everyone's gonna get caught. And you're gonna be like, I didn't see it coming because it worked for six years. Just, I mean, listen, if you can afford the risk, go for it. I work with companies that can't afford the risk. And in fact, it's not only about affording, it's about if, if we put them in that situation, Mm -hmm. Even three, five, 10 years from now, like we can't do that. We're, they're hiring us to be their advisors. So it's about obtaining growth as quickly as possible, but it's also about mitigating risk. And that's a really big part of like the advice that my team and I give our clients is like, actually, you shouldn't do that, even though it's working because it's going to get you in trouble later. We've just seen it over and over. It's hard to have those conversations, but it's part of our job. Yeah, it's, um, I, th I think what, there is definitely a community of SEOs that are just looking for the next quick win um, and they're not really looking into like future proof in their site. And it, it, it is a shame because some of them are really talented SEOs. Yeah. But they're just looking for the next, how, how can I make 10 grand in a month? And it's like, well, why, <laughs> not, why not SEO? Just, yeah, <laughs> definitely not. Um, but yeah, so going on to the personal brand side of stuff um because how, how long have you been doing seo for 14 years 14 years right okay so i would have been like nine years old when, when you when you first started <laughs> out. i was basically i was about 20 yeah right how, how did you get into seo i kind of stumbled into it when i was in college um so first of all i i come from a tech family straight up like my father is a software engineer, retired software engineer. He worked at Sun Microsystems and Oracle. And we grew up in the Bay Area. Like my dad literally commuted to Silicon Valley and worked in the original Facebook office, what's now the Facebook office. It used to be Sun Microsystems and uh, taught my brother and me HTML in like 92. I mean, I, I was a baby. My brother was like five. My brother was building websites when he was like five, six, seven. I was building websites when I was eight. Like we just were the nerdiest little family. And uh, uh, my brother is now a professional web developer. He started a new, a new job recently with Apple. And I have been pretty techie, really good with computers my whole career. But like I started studying politics at NYU mm -hmm. and I just like found SEO on the side and was like, wait, this seems like a better future than going to law school <laughs> and taking out loans. <laughs> Turns out it was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so then uh, how, how did that transition to like building your personal brand because obviously you've got like over 50,000 followers on on Twitter um you've got like you're, you're doing the speaking gigs and stuff like that you've got your own agency and stuff yeah yeah I actually hit I'm, I hit like 88,000 the other day and uh, I'm only really curious about the fact that I keep growing Twitter followers because I'm like, aren't people leaving Twitter? <laughs> like, but I guess people are still in Twitter, uh, which is great because building an audience and losing it really sucks. Um, honestly, like I, I didn't set out to build a personal brand in the SEO space. In fact, it never even occurred to me until like maybe five, four or five years ago. Um, I was working within the agency environment, which I still am in New York. Mm -hmm. I mean, before COVID, it was a very different life. This was like getting dressed up, going to meetings, speaking to CEOs of big brands, pitching them SEO, explaining why SEO is important, trying to win business, running teams. I've grown two different teams to acquisition. Um, currently have a 35 person SEO team. When I started at this agency, we were eight people on the SEO team. So doing a lot of like running teams, managing teams. And turns out the best way to learn SEO is working at agencies, point blank. Like you have so many clients so many situations, so many personalities, managing people, managing SEO teams, so much collaboration. Like I speak mm -hmm. to my team every single morning with 35 people sharing ideas, um, different tools to experiment with, just like so many things and it's rapid fire as opposed to like running one website, which is great, which I've done. When you run a hundred clients at the same time, you learn very, very quickly. So I got pretty good at what I was doing, maybe like seven or eight years into doing this thing. And I was going to a lot of SEO conferences and generally speaking, it was like older men speaking, which is fine. That's like the old days of SEO. Um, it didn't occur to me that I could speak. I think the first younger woman speaker that I saw was Aleda and I saw Aleda 
uh, maybe what, 2016. And I was like, wow, you're allowed to be a young woman on stage and know as much as she knows and speak in two languages. And like, boom, like I was like, it was crazy. And then little by little at conferences, there were people speaking where I was like, that's not true. <laughs> what that person just said is not how things work. So little by little, I started to get like a voice like within my company. And then I think I pitched SMX in 2018 and I was able to speak there about EEAT for the first time, or EAT for the first time. And I was like, wow, people want to hear what I have to say. This is crazy. <laughs> that's, that's, that's how it started. What's, um, what's, so you've grown the agency from an eight person team to 35. That's quite with the help of others yes yeah, and by the way that's just others. one team we're a very big marketing agency i just oversee the seo team right okay what's well, um because there's going to be a lot of like seo agency owners that want to be able to scale to that um what, what's what's been some like friction that you've had because obviously we, we've got like a 15 person seo team and for example somebody's dog dies and the 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 team morale's down or mm. potentially there's 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 people leaving like how how do you how do you maintain a team that big you raise a very good question that's very much pertinent to um the struggles of agency life and um it's really tricky i think i have a certain form of let's say leadership and um management style that i have that uh i'm very authentic i'm very friendly probably more so than the average hr person would want like just because you know in management training they tell you don't be friends with the people that you manage right and i'm like i'm totally friends with many of the people that i manage i've, I've always been like that uh i just think it's better to work that way together within reason um but yeah um helping people feel like they're being seen and respected as human beings um you know I've been on teams where we go to each other's weddings, we go to each other's birthday parties, we hang out all the time as friends, we work out together. Like that's, for me, it creates a better working environment. So if somebody's dog dies, which is awful, tell them, you know what, take two days and just go take the time you need. You know, we see you, we respect you, we'll, we'll cover for you, we got you, you know? Like showing up for people in that way really helps with retention. And that's not even a, th a thing where retention should be the goal, that's just being a good person. So I try to employ that all the time with the people that I work with. But a, another answer to your question is just delegation and having people doing different things and different responsibilities. So like, I don't, I don't mean to make it sound like I'm the only person running this SEO team. There's five, four or five directors as well. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of people overseeing the thing. It's, it's a big operation. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's good. And then what about like when it comes to hiring new staff because obviously th th there might be let's say out of the 35 there might be a couple people that leave every year and you might need to rehire and stuff like that what's that looking like well luckily we uh, work at an agency where we do have a hiring department which really helps that wasn't always mm. the case again we grew from eight people to 35 people and got acquired in the middle so that things have changed a lot at the company um but it's really a matter of first of all developing a, a team hierarchy and a team structure where we have certain tiers, expected knowledge for each tier, people working together in smaller groups or smaller pods, and then understanding, okay, this person left. What did that person bring to the table? Okay, that person was really good with Looker Studio. That person was really passionate about local SEO and they had six different local clients. So you can kind of get to like, these are the skills that that person had, or even like soft stuff. Like that person was really vivacious and they brought all this energy. So like, that's not something that you can look for in a resume, but it's something you might think about when it's like, we need someone to come to the team with like a lot of ideas and a lot of inspiration and they're trying things. So we, we, we look for all that when we're interviewing to kind of fill the gaps that were left when somebody leaves. Right. Yeah. That, that's good. We, we, we've, we've got like a very similar ish style where um like for example if, if somebody leaves everything is pretty like well documented as as well like our, our sops are, are pretty decent i, I want to say they're they're a lot better than what they were four years ago i'll, I'll tell you that sure. um so w w whenever somebody does leave which is pretty rare um in, in our case um we, we were able to like really quickly retrain them and stuff like that. and i think that that's really important especially if if you're working in like quite a 
fast paced environment. Yeah. Yes, that's that's essential. And it's something that uh, our team is getting a better handle on now. We were so busy with like everybody so busy with servicing clients all the time that the last thing you always want to do is manage yourselves. Right. It's like it's like same with the SEO on an SEO agency website. It's like you're so you're doing SEO for so many other people. You forget to do SEO for yourself. Right. So it took us, I would say, until the last few years where the directors are literally getting together in person we did this about four months ago. We got together in New York, sat in a room for two straight days. Like, don't bother us because we're building out process, hiring, workflows, documenting where everything is. And that was tedious work, but it was necessary work. Yeah, it, it's it's always like the the work that nobody wants to do, right? It's like, oh, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll do I'll do that SOP on Friday and then it never gets done. Doesn't get done. Um, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so one, one question about your agency, cause it's, it's, it's a little bit more intriguing to other guests that I've had on, um, you mainly deal with a lot more enterprise style clients. Um, how, how did that come about? Cause a, a lot of SEO agency owners that I've spoke to in the past, they're more so like local businesses or they do SEO for local businesses or they do SEO for e-commerce stores nothing to your caliber um did, did you go in thinking this is the type of client i want or did you just slowly gradually build up to that yeah sure well for one thing i don't know if you know this or not it's not my agency um right. i just run the seo team so i work for some other wonderful people and when i joined this agency before we were acquired we were about 40 people which is wild because now with the acquisition it's like a thousand maybe more um, and we offer like almost every service in the digital and search world. So we're able to, and that's what enterprise clients want. They usually want an agency that's going to be able to do multiple services or channels with them simultaneously, especially like paid and SEO, because theoretically we're supposed to be sharing paid and SEO insights as much as possible when we service enterprise clients. Um, but that happened naturally. That's a, that's a combination of showing your skills, uh, getting, you know, clients to stick around for a while, clients that are willing to share testimonials, building case studies, winning awards, um, the type of work that I do and why, why the agency encourages me to do as much public facing stuff as I do. Um, first of all, I like it. That's important. But second of all, it drives a lot of visibility, um, more and more enterprise visibility over time, just by virtue of being very public in the SEO industry and sharing original ideas. So it, it compounds upon itself, um, but it's not just me. Like there's a lot of other people working and there's we also have incredible skills and offerings on the paid media side, for example. So enterprise clients tend to come when they can see, oh, this this agency can do a lot of things, right? Yeah, it's um, it, it, everything that you mentioned then. So like speaking at the conferences, winning awards, um, getting the testimonials that all loops back around to EAT as well. <laughs> it's kind of like the most obvious thing. I don't know. I just don't understand why it's controversial. Like it's just marketing. Guys. <laughs> um, so obviously we've, we've spoke about like scaling out the agency, um, building out the team, getting more of the enterprise SEO clients and stuff, but what's been some failures along the way? Um, like sh surely there's there's a couple things that like stick out and you're like ah yeah failures i think it's not exactly failures but um like any agency or like any company you know the chal external challenges like ec economics the economy or the pandemic or things like this that are like major major curveballs where mm. uh suddenly clients budgets dry up overnight and guess what? The first thing that's on the chopping block is always SEO. It's already hard enough to get companies to invest in SEO when the economy is good. <laughs> so those have been some big hurdles and challenges where we had to do layoffs one time. You know, it's not unusual these days in the SEO space. Um, with COVID, we lost several clients overnight because their entire business model was working with people in person and there wasn't any way around that, you know? So it's like, they had to get rid of their marketing agency during that time. And the challenge there is not every, every company in the whole world faced the same challenges around those times, but the, the challenge is how do you 
keep morale high, keep people feeling good about their jobs, people keep people feeling secure. And I would say that AMSIV in particular did a really great job with that. I was very impressed. We did everything we could, for example, during COVID to not have any layoffs, mm -hmm. um, which was quite challenging. <laughs> but and to be really transparent and forthcoming with the company about what's going on financially, taking care of people when they were scared or sick or whatever, like just being human, first and foremost, has always been really important to me and to the places that I work, which I think is really important. Making people feel like they're humans and not just another cog in the machine has been uh, it, it always pays for itself with, yeah. with retention. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and then <clears throat> what's uh what the work-life balance like because I, I saw a tweet that you'd done recently and it was the head of google i want to say where he's got 20 phones and, and you, <laughs> you, you you said i couldn't i couldn't imagine having 20 phones i've just got one and i'm so busy what, what what's yeah. the work-life balance like well i would say on average and this is not unique to our agency but the agency work-life balance particularly in a place like new york city is not going to be as great as working nine to five at some other place. Like uh, it's just too many clients with too many fire alarms happening simultaneously all the time. And it's different in Europe, but in the U S it's very much a culture of like, got to respond to the client at midnight because I mean, we don't really do that as much, but like if you have a really big client and you're an agency, they are paying you a lot of money and they expect that level of service. And when you multiply that by multiple different clients, it means that you're kind of working a lot around the clock. Sometimes you go to the gym in the evening and then there's a really important client email at nine o'clock at night and you've got to get that email out. Like that's just how the agency world is. So there's that component, but me personally, I make myself unnecessarily busy. So I'm always doing some type of SEO thing on the side. I'm doing talks, I'm doing presentations. I'm also a DJ. I'm also a homeowner. I also have a dog. I also have friends. I have a gym. I have like so many things that are like choices that I make. <laughs> I create my own problems, but mm -hmm. that's why I'm so busy. It's not just the job. It's the lifestyle. Yeah. Do you, um, do you struggle with being present? Like say for example, you're, I don't know, you're out with your friends and you get that important email. Like, do you struggle yeah. with it? I, uh, have, the answer to this question has very much evolved over time. As I've gotten older, and of course my responsibilities have changed, and of course I'm in quite a, a lucky place as far as like having worked my butt off for a really long time and being able to have certain freedoms and flexibilities where absolutely no chance that I'm looking at my phone or looking at work email when I'm out with my friends. That is sacred time. I mean, like, yeah, something enormous happens and my phone's blowing up, I'll take care of it. That's very rare. But I've learned how to prioritize things that are really important to me, like my friends and my music and going to the gym. Every time I'm in the gym, phone's away. That's me time. That's me and my body. That's it. You know? Yeah. So uh, I don't let myself get distracted by all this stuff. Now, something that's difficult for me is when I'm, for example, on vacation, like taking two days off, <laughs> which I'm about to do next week. We'll see how I'm taking a whole week off, which I never do. But like... I will naturally end up on Twitter and something will naturally happen in the SEO space. And suddenly I'm on the beach, like tweeting about SEO. That's more so the passion than it is like ex the expectations of my job. I'm going to make a prediction when you're on holiday or w when you're on vacation, there might be a core algorithm update. And if, if that happens, you would going not to be the first time. <laughs> it would not be the first time. Uh, and I, that, listen, if there's a core update next week, I will be on vacation. Uh, that's, entirely possible i've been expecting one any day now um hopefully google's not listening because i have no idea if that actually bears their decisions i'm just kidding of course it doesn't <laughs> but uh yeah th that's happened there was a time last year when the helpful content update was launched and i was in austria or prague one of those places and i i quite literally didn't have to do this but i felt like i needed to stop everything i was doing and start working on that so mm -hmm. i spent the weekend in prague sitting in bars and restaurants working on the helpful content update because it's like i gotta do this right now it just has to happen right now yeah uh, how, how would you so obviously you've mentioned like the gym um before we actually went live um you mentioned that you were in argentina for seven weeks as well how how would you how would you chill out is it is like the gym your chill out time or, or do you do anything else um obviously you, you mentioned dj and stuff 
yeah, yeah. The the gym is not it's not my chill out time, but it's like my my medicine. It's like my my uh, the reason that I can function the way that I function is because I work out almost every day. Mm-hmm. Um, I DJ. Yeah, I uh, I'm pretty serious as a DJ. I've been DJing over ten years. I play out a lot. It's been toning down a little bit lately because SEO has been so busy. But um, I'm very involved in the music industry in New York and in other places. I, I attend a lot of shows you know a lot i see a lot of djs i have a lot of friends that are djs i'm kind of like often out hearing music very very frequently um i have a lot of friends that i hang out with i have a cute little dog who's over here and uh travel when i'm traveling i might shut down the computer for two hours go biking go shopping go lay by the pool right like they there's a reason why i like to travel so much i like to absorb the culture as well two two final questions what is your favorite country to go to like on a vacation vacation i think um well i had a i've been to argentina many times and this was i just got back from seven weeks there and that was a very special trip so argentina buenos aires is very very close to my heart i really love it there but it's not really vacation it's actually it's a kind of like another place to go have a work life i have a whole routine there i have like a gym i have places that i work i have like my healthy routine it's like it's really more like another new york for me in summer (laughs) summer right now during february um but i would say probably in general spain spain is the place to chill (laughs) and go on vacation where's where's your go-to place in spain i mean i've been to barcelona the most times it's always like whenever you're there, you're like, oh, this is the best place in the world. Um, but Malaga, um, smaller cities in Andalusia, like you kind of can't go wrong. Everywhere in Spain is amazing. Yeah, I I particularly like um, Mallorca. We're, like we, we never go, like, been maybe, twice, three, two two or three times a year. Amazing, um, really really nice island, chilled vibes. Obviously, you need to pick where you want to stay. Like there's there's a party strip. You might not want to go to the party strip. There's yeah. a nicer area there. Um, so, you, yeah, you, you can pick and choose. Um, and then the last question, you need to give up one thing, either DJing or you give up SEO. Which one do you give up? People always ask me this question. Oh, really? <laughs> well, always some version of which one I like better. Um the reality is that both are necessary and it's not just DJing. If, if I would say more broadly, it's music because I've been playing drums since I was six years old. I was in rock bands growing up very seriously mm-hmm. for a long time. So that kind of transitioned into, into DJing, but I cannot have my life with one or the other. I would be miserable uh, doing only SEO without music mm-hmm. and doing only music without SEO. Uh, I would not be intellectually stimulated the way that I am now. And I also wouldn't make any money. So <laughs> Um, I think I'll probably double down on SEO for the foreseeable future, more so than music. And I want to get myself to a place financially where I can relax the work a little bit and have more time for music. Great answer. So where can people find you? You can Google my name, Lily Ray, and take your choice of any social platform. I'm on most of them, but uh, I think Twitter and LinkedIn is where I'm most active. So it's at Lily Ray NYC. All right, perfect. Thank you so much for joining me, Lily. Thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, great stuff. Thanks for watching, guys. Cheers.